the, this is the day, the one weekend a year where you get to rub it in if your football team made the Super Bowl and sit on the front row. Oh. <laughs> yep, yeah. but that's okay. God is good, amen? amen. <laughs> Revelation chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. That's where we're going to be at today. Revelation chapter 5. If you do not have a Bible with you, the scripture will be on the screen momentarily. If you do not own a good study Bible, please see me before you leave. I want to get one into your hands for free. There's no catch. You don't have to fill anything out. I just, I believe God wants you to have his word in your life. It will change your life forever. Amen. Amen. The exciting thing about it is if we can just change one life, we have the potential of changing a generation. Yes. Uh, you know, so... Revelation chapter 5, beginning with the first verse, and we're going to read this part. We're going to read the chapter in its entirety, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, and the Word of God says this, praise the Lord. Remember, this is John, okay, he's on the Isle of Patmos, all right. He's been taking up in spirit, if you remember a couple weeks ago when we were together, and verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, that's God, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. That's Jesus, y'all. Verse 6, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, we looked at what the word said about the four living creatures. We looked at the elders. We looked at the seven spirits of God. So let's move forward. Verse 9, and they sang a new song. Now, you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about the song that they were singing. Now we see at this part, a new song is being sung, and this is what it is. Verse 9, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. So that's the new song at this point. Verse 11, John writes, then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That's the end of the chapter. Church, listen to me. This entire chapter in Revelation 5 is all about our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. That's it. Amen. The entire chapter 
is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has redeemed us. Anybody say amen to that? He paid a debt, church. He paid a debt that we ourselves could never pay on our own. He saved us from our sin. He has purchased us by his blood that he shed on the cross for every single one of us in this room. Can you say amen to that? In John chapter 129, write that down if you're taking notes, church. In John, the first chapter, the 29th verse. John 129, John the Baptist saw Jesus walking towards him. And at that point, John the Baptist says this. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, that's your junk. Yeah, that's your junk. That's your sin. That's your problem. That's your issues. Whatever you have going on in life. Listen, what John said then stands today. Behold, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, and he has come for one reason, to take away the sins of the earth. Amen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. You're not exempt from that. No matter, and this is what I mean, let me explain it. No matter what problem you have, don't you ever let the devil make you think that you cannot be forgiven. Amen. He came, listen, for the sin of the world. Yes. That means for the entirety of the human race. Earlier, we just read in chapter 5 of Revelation, for every tribe, for every nation, for every language. You understand? Amen. All right. He is the Redeemer. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this sentence down. Jesus Christ is our kinsman. Redeemer, K-I-N-S-M-A-N. Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. We're going to talk about that as we go forward through the fifth chapter of Revelation. But we need to understand, walk in the knowledge and the truth, the fact that Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. In other words, kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ acted on our behalf, and because he did, the shed blood of Jesus Christ has washed us, and we are forgiven. Now, if you want to make that statement personal, this is what it's going to sound like for you. Jesus Christ has acted on my behalf. He's my kinsman redeemer. You understand that? And so you could say the exact same thing and make it personal. Jesus Christ has acted on my behalf. Now, let's just thank the Lord for that. Amen? Look, I know we're missing a lot of people, but we still got a good crowd here. We could be excited about Jesus being our kinsman redeemer and acting on our behalf. Amen? I mean, he got you here safely. Let's just rejoice in him while we're here. Amen? Now, so let's get right into it. Let's get right into the chapter, and let's take it, and let's see what the Word says. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. The Word of God says this, praise the Lord. John writes, John writes this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now, let me just tell you something when you're studying the book of Revelation. Everything is not meant for us to understand, but do you know that the Word of God does say that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things? So in other words, whatever you need to know, the Holy Spirit will teach you if you need to know it. Amen? All right, so look at it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, John writes, And then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Let me tell you something. Let's look at what the scripture does tell us. John sees God on the throne. Yes. Okay. John sees God on the throne. And in the hand of the Father, God Almighty, yes. as he sits on the throne, is a scroll. The scroll is wrapped up. There's seven separate, seven different seals on it. And John can see that there's writing both on the outside of the scroll as it's rolled up as well as on the inside of the scroll. So there's writings on both sides, which means this, church. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Nothing can be added to it. Amen. Nothing can be added to it. And you say, what does that have to do with significance of us today? Everything. Everything. Because watch this. The plan of God is not going to change at the last minute. Amen. The plan of God is not going to change. And then all of a sudden we say, whoa, what do we have to do now? Maybe you got some people in your life that act like that. Uh, they're one way 
And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, because it doesn't go their way, they say, well, we got to do this. Like, well, wait a minute, I thought we were doing this. No, 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 we got to do it like this. No, no, no. There's writing on the front. There's writing on the back. It's completed. Amen. You understand? It's completed. Amen. See, let's take it to another level on it. The word of God that you have in your lap so that you're reading on that screen when it comes up, it does not change. Amen. What's written in the book. Matter of fact, we're going to see this uh, 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 a few weeks from now when we get towards the end of Revelation or a couple months, a few months, however long it takes for us to get there. God as God wills. But it talks about don't add anything to this book. Don't take nothing from this book. And if you do, the plagues of this book shall be added to you. So see, God... Look, God is serious when it comes. See, this is so good when you tie it all together. If you've, if you've been coming for prior Sundays, see, this stuff starts to come back. You remember when, when John says he was before the throne in, in, in the first few chapters? John was before the throne, and at the throne was a rainbow. And remember, we studied in the Word of God how the reason the rainbow is around the throne is because God made a covenant with the people that he would never again destroy the earth by flood. He would never again destroy man by flood. And what did he do? It was the covenant was a sign. The rainbow was a sign of a covenant. So God said, I made a covenant with my people, so I'm going to take the sign of that covenant and I'm going to put it around me on the throne. God is a God of his word. He does not shift. He does not change. He does not move. If God said it, God meant it, God's going to do it. Hear that now. If you take a note, you can jot that down. If God said it, God meant it, and God's going to do it. We could do a t-shirt out of that right there. If God said it, God meant it, he's going to do it. God's going to do it. You understand? And so here... John sees the scroll, it's, got, it's in the hand of God, okay, so imagine this now, imagine the importance and the symbolism of what, what, what God, uh, John is allowed to see, what God is allowing John to see. He looks up, there's God on the throne. We remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how the scripture says in prior chapters of Revelation that constantly around the throne of God, it says there's thunder and peals of what? Lightning! Remember that? All right, and so, now look, now see, if you weren't here to see that, you missed that exciting part. You just see, oh, well, you see right now, you're just thinking, well, God, well, John is looking at God around his throne, and God's sitting there with a scroll in his hand. No, 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 no. It's much more than that. Yes. Because we read early in Revelation that God is sitting there, he's got a scroll in his hand, and according to prior chapters, there's still lightning, yes. and there's still thunder, right? And then there's the elders, remember we talked about that? And then there's the four living creatures, that are worshiping. Remember we talked about that? And then John says, and I see a scroll in his hand. And there's just so much power and there's so much activity and there's so much busyness going on. And even in the midst of all that, it's the peace of God himself. Yes, the Lord. Amen. And the scroll does not change. Amen. Nothing's going to be added to it. Yeah. And we as the church, we as the Christians, we get blessed by that knowing that this is truth, this is the only truth, and this does not change. Amen? Amen. Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. And let me just tell you this. What is written on the scroll is final. Do you understand that? It's final. Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. John writes this. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now you've got to understand the power of what's going on. The second verse says this, John writes, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Now think about that first of all. You ever seen a big, strong man and you're just like, wow, that's a big fellow. Yeah. Okay, well just, just think about how that little bit, you know, of appreciation for a big man. I mean, we see some big men, but I was walking, we were, we were on a family vacation in Williamsburg a couple years ago, and I looked over and there was this man sitting in a chair he was so tall that his, even sitting in the chair, his kneecaps were up near his chest in the air height-wise. I was like, oh my goodness, look how uncomfortable it is for that giant of a man to sit in a normal chair. And he was, a, he was an older fella, he was elderly, 
Uh, and and it, it, it was just remarkable how tall this guy was. I mean, I want to say he was like seven five, seven six. I mean, he was just uh, he was just a remarkable of a man. I mean, just just tall. And I and and, and I walk over to this guy, and I, I took Elijah over to this guy, and I, and, and, and I said, Hey, son, I, I, let's let's go over and just ask this man if he'll stand up, because I want you to see how tall this man is. And I walk up to the man and I said, sir, I just, first of all, he's, a, he's an elderly man. I said, sir, first of all, I just want to apologize because I'm going to ask you to do something that you've probably been asked to do a billion times. And I even told him, I said, it looks like you're hurt. You know, it looks like you may not even want to get up. But I just told my son, I can tell how tall you are. I said, would you mind just standing up? And he said, ah, yeah, no problem. So this guy stands up, okay, and we're just like, midsection to this. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you get somebody that's towering over seven foot. And I'm just sitting there looking at this guy, and I was like, everything about you looks like it hurts. And he actually, I actually said that later on. I said, if you don't mind me asking, you know, how, how bad does your body hurt? And he says, man, it's, it's terrible. I was in such awe at the sheer size of the man. Maybe you've seen somebody like that in your life before. You've just been awed at how he towers. That compares in nothing to what John says he sees when he uses the words mighty angel. And I saw a mighty angel. You can't just take it and say, oh, he saw an angel. Oh, he saw an angel. He saw a mighty angel. Now, I want you to look at what he says. And I saw a mighty angel. Now, this angel is doing something. What's he doing? He's proclaiming. And he's not just proclaiming, but he's doing what? Proclaiming with a what? A loud voice. And so imagine that as John looks and he's caught up in the spirit and there is the, the throne and there's lightning and there's thunder and there's the elders and there's the four, uh, the four beasts, the scripture calls it, the four living creatures. And they're all singing and proclaiming and worshiping. And then in the midst of all that power that's coming out of God himself on the throne, John says, I saw a mighty angel and he's proclaiming with a loud voice. See, some, some, people, some people come into a church and they'll never come back because the worship was loud. Y'all sang too loud to Jesus. It's just, the music is too loud. Oh, you've got some rude awakening coming. Let me just tell you what I believe. I believe that the, the listen, I believe that the angel that John hears right here what he's saying is louder than what you heard in them speakers. Because listen, listen, when a declaration is made in heaven, everyone in heaven hears it. But we'll go and say, can y'all can please turn that music down? Can, can, please turn it. You don't know the job of the sound room. They'll have some people say, turn it up. Other people say, turn it down. They'll tell Joe, it's cold in here. Someone else, as he's going to change it, it's hot in here. Yes. Amen. Hey, we, we just don't have a clue what heaven's going to be like. Amen. There's a loud, a loud voice coming from a mighty angel, and he's proclaiming, and there's thunder, and there's lightning. The elders are bowing down. The living creatures, they're going off in worship, and it's just all this is taking place, and no one's going to be able to say, that's a little loud. Amen. I'm not coming back. They, they raise their hands in worship. They must be a cult. What are they doing? No, they're surrendering. That's what people are doing. This is what he's proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break his seals? Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? So he proclaims that 
with a loud voice and all of heaven, all of heaven hears it. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And the third verse says this, church, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. And then John writes this in the fourth verse. And I began to what, church? Weep. I began to weep loudly. And the reason, the reason he's doing it, he says, is because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look in it. Now let me just tell you this, because here's the good news. Jesus Christ died on the cross, therefore, listen to this, write this down. The scroll represents Christ's title deed. The scroll represents the title deed of Christ to all that God has promised him. This is the really cool thing about this particular scroll. This particular scroll represents the title deed to all that God has promised him. A title deed or a will can only be opened by the appointed heir. That's why only one could open it. The only one that can open this scroll is the one who's found worthy. Write this down. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Hebrews Chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, 2 says that Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. Now listen, that's good when you begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together. That gets really good. Jesus Christ is the heir to all things. Now, John, John is weeping loudly at this point because no one has been found worthy to open the scroll. But remember... Only the appointed heir could open the scroll. Now listen to this. In order to be a redeemer. Remember earlier we said Jesus was our kinsman redeemer. In order to be a kinsman redeemer, one had to be near of kin, willing to redeem and able to redeem. Now I've got some good news for you. Jesus Christ met all the standards. Amen. Jesus Christ is more than enough. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Let's go forward in the chapter. And the word of God, the Bible says this, praise the Lord. And one of the elders said to me, what? Weep no more. And so he's weeping. And the elder, one of the elders says, weep no more. Behold, the lion, capital L, so here's the title. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he, Jesus, can open the scroll and its seven seals. Mm. Verse 6 says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now listen, church, there's three important titles of Jesus Christ that are mentioned at this part of the chapter. Number one, write this down. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's the first title mentioned. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. You may remember in the Old Testament when Israel asked for a king. Remember that? They didn't have one. They wanted one. They were griping for a man to rule over them. God gave them Saul. Anybody remember that? Okay. When when Saul uh, was given over to Israel as king, you need to understand that Saul was never meant to establish a dynasty because he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. The tribe of Benjamin. So God used Saul not to rule and reign and his lineage come behind him. God used Saul to discipline Israel. However, David was next in line and David is from the tribe of Judah. Okay? David is from the tribe of Judah. Son of David. Write that down in your notes. Son of David. Son of David was a title often used when Jesus was ministering on the earth. And so the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion symbolizes strength, victory, courage, sovereignty, and power. 
And so here we have Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 5 mentioned as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the son of David. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I, 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 I thought Joseph was his daddy's name. And see, this is one of the things that they were debating about. Jesus actually yeah. talked to a group of religious zealots, if you will, and they were debating over this. And he said, well, how can he be called the son of David if Joseph is his daddy? Here's the reason. Listen to me. Jesus was here before Joseph. Amen. You got that? Amen. Jesus was here from the very beginning of time. Amen. But it all came down through that lineage. Yes. And so this is absolutely huge. He is the son of David, the lion of of the tribe of Judah. Sovereignty, strength, power, authority. God is in control. The second title mentioned in Revelation chapter 5 for Jesus Christ. Jesus is, write this down, Jesus is the root of David. He's the root of David. Now we're going to talk about this, a little bit about piggybacking off of what I just mentioned a moment ago. As far as a family tree goes, Jesus has roots in David. But as far as the deity of Jesus is concerned, Jesus is the root of David. So Jesus brought this very topic up to a group of Pharisees. We're just going to go there. Go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22, and let's look at the 41st verse. I reference it, and now we're going to read it. Matthew twenty-two forty-one. 41. The word of God says this, praise the Lord. Now, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then David, if, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Amen. Now hear that now, verse 45. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions listen church here's the answer in a, in a simple form Jesus Christ was here both before and after David simple as you're going to get it right there Jesus Christ was here both before and after David number three and so the first title we have is Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah the second title, Jesus is the root of David. The third title, the third name given to Jesus in this part of the text is Lamb. Capital L, A, M, B. He's the Lamb. Write this down. At least 28 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is mentioned as a Lamb. At least 28 times, he's found to be mentioned in the book of Revelation as a Lamb. The Lamb presents... Listen, both the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Yes. He was the lamb that was sacrificed. Yes. He's both the person and the sacrifice. Yes. Revelation chapter 6, 16, write that down. In Revelation 6, 16, it mentions the wrath of the lamb. Let's go ahead and turn there. Revelation 6, 16. And the Bible says, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the what? Lamb. Revelation 7, 14. Look at that. Revelation 7, 14 says this. I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the what? Lamb. And so you see what the blood of the lamb does? Yeah. Washes us and makes us whiter than snow. Yeah. Revelation 21.9. Go there with me quickly. 
Revelation 21, 9. Revelation 21, 9 says this. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the what? Lamb. Now go back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. We've got the Lamb. Title number three. Title number two, the root of David. Title number one, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 6, and the word of God says this, praise be to God. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad where Scripture guarantees us, for God so loved the world. See, all of mankind is included in that. As it says in a little bit, we're going to read, remember, every tribe, every nation, every language. For God so loved the world, that's us. Okay. And so here, John says, I see a lamb standing as though he's already been slain. Yes. You understand? Mentioning the sacrifice that has already taken place by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Earlier, we just read uh, in another place in Revelation, it talked about how the, the robes were dipped in blood. Yes. Rather than the robes coming out red, they came out what? Is, now, now you would think that just does not make sense. So imagine, imagine if I had a, a big tub of red paint up here and it was a clear tub, you could see through it and you knew it was red. And I took, I took a garment, I took your coat or, or, or something, jacket or something like that and I went and I dipped it in this basin full of red and I woo, 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 washed it all around it and I brought it out. You would initially think that's going to come out what? Red. But instead of coming out red, it comes out white, and it's clean, and it's been purified. See, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. Yeah. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And you think, oh my goodness, that just doesn't make sense. How did my jacket go in that red tub? It came out white, and it was cleaner than it was the day that I bought it. It's pure. How does that? Well, listen, to the person in the world that just doesn't, hasn't been drawn by God, listen, the word of God is foolishness to them. That's what the scripture says. Amen. That the scripture says that the word of God is foolish. That's why it also says that the spirit, it's the spirit of God that draws man unto himself. So if the spirit is not drawing a man unto himself, we can go minister all day long and beat him over the head with the biggest Bible you own. And they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Amen. They're just going to tell you, I don't want what you're selling. I don't want what you got. No, no, no. Don't invite me to that church no more. Amen. Don't invite me to, to, to whatever you got going on at that church. I don't want to go to your luncheon. I'm, 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 I'm. And the right thing to do is to continue to invite because you may never know when it is that the Spirit is going to draw them unto themselves. So you keep inviting, you keep inviting, you keep inviting. But look, I'm just telling you this. If they ever look at you like you're stupid, it's because that's how they see it. Yes. Amen. You understand? That's how they see it. The Bible tells us that. To them, it's foolishness. Yes. It's foolishness. They can't understand why God would send his only son because they would never relinquish their son for the rest of the world. And listen, the lost individual, the unsaved folks, they got problems with loving people in, 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 with, because they don't understand the love of Christ. So if you do something wrong to them, they figure I'm going to repay wrong to you. You don't like me, I ain't going to like you. And look, I'm not saying that Christians have that all together too well either. But what I'm saying is we still do have the love of Christ in us, so at least we know how to love. Yes. We've been forgiven by Christ, and the Word of God says that as we have been forgiven by Jesus, we also should forgive others, as it, treat others as we have been treated ourselves, love as we've been loved, forgive as we've been forgiven. So at least we've got the standard. At least we know the model of what it's going to be like, but the world doesn't have even the model. Amen. I mean, you just look on the news, and you see how rampant sin has become. 
And they're being trained by media, they're being trained by television, they're being trained by Hollywood, uh, what, what, what the new normal is supposed to look like in its filth and its rampantness. So the model that they do have, that they look up to and that they idolize, is just going to hell. Amen. And that's the truth of the matter. Yes, it is. That is the truth of the matter. So see, they don't even, they don't even know the standard. And so to them, to take a garment into red, to bring it out white, it just doesn't make sense. Amen. But listen to me. That's what the blood of Christ does. Amen. Preach it. See, the reason we don't have judgment hanging over us anymore is because of the blood of Christ. Amen. The reason I'm forgiven for all my past sins, the reason you're forgiven for all your past sins is because of the blood of Christ. You understand? Listen, whether you stole someone's gum, whether you stole money, whether you stole a truck, it all broke the law of God. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. If someone, now listen, someone may have a hard time with this, but look, it just is what it is. If you murdered a man or if you broke into a home, look, you still, both things were breaking the law of God. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And the reason, the reason it comes down to all breaking it is because we have a righteous God who is holy. And he's not going to look at it like this. Well, you just did a little bit of bad. No, you did a lot of bad. No. So I'm going to show more mercy on the one that did a little bit of bad. No, no, no. In the eyes of God, because he's faithful and true, yes. bad is bad. Amen. Wrong is wrong. Amen. See, and it can be hard for us as adults to, to, to swallow that sometimes because... Look, it's how we treat our children, isn't it? We show favor and we love them because they're ours and halfway because we lazy parent, okay? And we say, well, that won't too bad. I don't feel like getting up. I'm just going to leave them alone. God forbid. Well, uh, right? And then grandparents, you got it worse. Grandparents got it worse because you say, oh, that's okay. Won't that cute? He said, oh, you whipped my tail when I did that. It won't cute then. I know, but they're not mine. They're my grandbabies. And it was just so funny. It wasn't funny when I did it. No. See, we don't know what it is to judge righteously. Amen. You understand? We don't because without Christ, we're not righteous. Amen. Without Christ, we're not holy. This is why we let some people get away with some things, other people get away with other things. And then someone just, you know, opens the door too loud and it's all of a sudden, why are you doing it? Don't miss it. He says that the robe, the garment was dipped in red and it came out pure. Now let that be an encouragement to you no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what it is. Number one, you got to understand that God knows you ain't hiding it from him. And number two, because he knows he's already willing to forgive you if you haven't sought forgiveness on it. So if you haven't sought forgiveness, accept forgiveness today. Accept Amen. the forgiveness of God today because it's there for Amen. you. Let's look at it. Revelation 5, 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, capital L, that's Jesus, standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Now, <laughs> jot this down. Seven is the number of protection. We're going to talk about these sevens. Seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of perfection. The seven horns represent perfect power. Yeah. Look, if you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, when it talks about the horn, it's talking about strength. You'll see that all throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The horn is talking about strength and symbolism. Yeah. This is why when you, how many people in here like to hunt? Anybody like to hunt? Okay. You see a big buck with big horns, that's his strength. Yes. That's his power. Yes. You say, no, it's the size of the animal. No, 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 I've killed big deer with two horns. Amen. And there's no strength in those little dinky things. No. Amen. Okay. Now, now, everybody in my hunt club, they call that a, a spike, a two-pointer. I call it an 11-pointer because to me, two ones is an 11. See what I'm saying? So, good way to look at it. Yeah. That's 11. The power, the horn, it symbolizes strength. Yes, it does. Strength. Praise God. And you see this, 
you see this deer, and he's just got all these horns, this crazy rack. Yes. And he comes up there, gets up next to the one with a smaller rack. Uh -huh. Who you think's going to win? Big rack. You ever seen in real life, have you ever seen an elk? Yes. And those horns, just so massive. And you look at that, and, and yeah, the animal's big, but so is a horse. See, the size of the elk, his body does not impress me, it's just like a horse. What impresses me about the elk is the horns. Amen. It's the horns. And so here, symbolizing this is strength, strength, strength. Nothing like a big old moose. Seven horns represent perfect power. The seven eyes that it mentioned in Scripture, write this down. It said they had seven eyes. The seven eyes represent perfect wisdom. In other words, he sees everything. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't hide from God. Hey, see, that's not to get anyone in trouble. That's because he loves us so much as a father, we can't outrun him. We can't out-slick them. We can't out-hide them. You understand? And see, God is faithful. He's not going to let you get away. He's not going to let you get away. You're not running from God very long. And listen, you're not going to run successfully either. The seven eyes represent perfect wisdom. And then the last seven that it mentions in this chapter, the seven spirits represent a perfect presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And see, something you must understand, and this is really good news, notice, notice where Jesus Christ is during all this. Jesus Christ, according to John's account, which we know is the truth, it's the word, Jesus Christ is in the midst of all that goes on in heaven. He's in the middle of it. When you get there, when I get there, if you want to find where Christ is, Go to the center of it. Make your way to the throne. Make your way to the Father, and there you'll find the Son. Now, let's just look at chapter 5, okay? Let's just look at chapter 5. Remember, Satan tried to kill him, but Jesus defeated death and rose again. Jesus, Jesus, right now as we speak, right now as you listen, as I speak, Jesus is ruling right now from glory. Jesus is ruling right now from glory. When you watch the news and you see disaster, Jesus is still ruling and reigning from glory. You understand? No matter what you have going on in your life right now, Jesus Christ is in control, ruling and reigning from glory in the midst of heaven and even at this very moment, there's still lightning and there's still thunder. And the elders are bowed down in worship. And the four beasts, the living creatures, are worshiping. And God is sitting there on the throne with a scroll in his hand. And there's Christ. There's the Messiah. There's Jesus right there in the midst of it all. Right there. See, hopefully, what you've been learning over the past few weeks as we study this book, have you ever heard someone say, where's God in all this? Now you know. Amen. Preach it. Yeah. Now you know. Yes, we do. The next time you hear someone gripe and complain, where's God in all this? Hey, I know. Wow. Hit the brakes. <laughs> now, I may not be able to quote Chapter and verse, but let me tell you what my pastor read out of Revelation. I know where God is in all this. He's sitting on a throne with a scroll in his hand. The scroll is the deed. It's the will that my kinsman redeemer can only open, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
And around him is 24 elders around the throne. And there's a rainbow shoots up over the throne. And let me tell you about the rainbow. It's a sign of a covenant that God won't destroy the earth and you and I by water or flood no more. But this time, he's coming to wreak havoc with fire. And so you don't want to be there when that goes down. But let me tell you something else about God. There's four living creatures and they're up here worshiping. And every time they sing a song, the Bible told me that the, the 24 elders fall down. They just get slain in the spirit. Just woo! And then they just worship it. And oh yeah, by the way, here's one of the coolest parts. Constantly, 24-7, 365, there's lightning and there's thunder coming up out the throne. And there's just power all over the place. And there's this seed that looks like glass coming out from the throne. And it's just incredible. So you wonder where God is. Jesus is in the midst of the power of God. See, man, I'm going to tell you, being a Christian is so fun. (laughs) My wife will tell you, I'll get off and go down like that in the public. I don't care. You ask me something, I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you about it. Because if we can't make it fun to to the world, they will never understand it. They just, remember, they see it as foolishness already. See, part of the problem with the body of Christ, part of the problem with the church is this. They're too uneducated. And the reason they're too uneducated is because, A, they don't get under sound good teaching. B, they don't come and get taught enough. Or C, they're not asking for the Holy Spirit to reveal them all things that Scripture says He will. And so they come to church, they check a box, they roll out, and they never go forward in evangelism. They never testify, they never share. You've been taught so much just in the past few minutes I've been preaching to you and and maybe some of you still don't understand the magnitude of what you've already heard Amen. just what you've heard in the past few minutes is enough to bring someone to the Lord Amen. Yes, it is. you don't need to go to seminary you don't no. need to go to college I never no. went to college I never went to seminary no. You, no 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 just be willing to do whatever God asks you to do and he yes. will put you out there for his Amen. glory He will put you out there for his glory if you just do what he asks you to do. If you just say what he wants you to say. I mean, look, where's God in all this? Every one of you got an answer now, don't you? See, I'm going to pray in just a few minutes that we, every one of us, get in an encounter where we hear someone say, where's God at? Yes! 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 It just like kicked the, kicked the door in. Yes! I'll tell you where he's at. It's like we need to make a shirt. We need to make a shirt. We need to make a shirt that says, ask me where God's at. That's right. Hallelujah. Just ask me where God's at. And then, and then when they ask you, man, it's like firing up a good old lawnmower. Whoa! I mean, it's just like cranking a good chainsaw. Boom! And you're just, you're just cutting them down, man. Just... There's work to be done. Amen. There's work to be done. My, my mom, is a great word that the Lord gave her on prepared, a prepared people. Yeah. See, today when you come in, you've been prepared now yeah. on where Jesus is. So many people say, where's Jesus at? Oh, he's in my heart. No, listen to me. The Spirit of God is living in you, but Jesus is in the center of the throne with God. It's the Spirit. Jesus says, when I go up, I'm going to send another. Yeah. Right? Hallelujah. Jesus, where he went where? Uh-huh. He went up. He went up. Right. Everybody say that. Jesus went up. Yeah. What came down? The Spirit. The, Spirit. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So where's Jesus at? Yeah. Let me tell you where he's at. Do I need to tell to y'all again? <laughs> Praise God. It's the Holy Spirit. That is left for the church. Amen. Giving power yes. and working yes. and speaking yes. the truth of God. It's the Holy Spirit that is doing things and manifesting. Yes. You understand? That's right. Do we see the hands and the feet of Jesus at work? Absolutely. Yes. That's what God is doing through the church. Amen. You understand? Yes. But listen, you'll never see a single miracle without the power and the move of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So where's Jesus at? No, 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 no. Not in your heart. The Bible says that the heart is sick. So if Jesus was in my heart, it wouldn't be sick. Amen. Amen. So what we have to do, we have to get off the elementary teachings of the faith that are wrong. Right. Just because it sounds good don't mean it's right. You understand? Amen. Be willing to want to be right, church. Right. Be willing to want to be right. Amen. It. It's the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, when I leave, the Father's sending another. That's right. Amen. And there's our power, yes. the Holy Spirit yes. of God. So where's Jesus? Everybody know where he's at now? Yeah, he's up in the throne room. Huh. Hey, listen, let me just tell you something. If Jesus let Now look, because I don't need nobody getting it twisted watching over the internet or whatever. So let me just put this out there. Yes, Jesus came for God so loved the world. It's the only way for our soul to be saved. Jesus is coming back. Yes, that proves that Jesus is not living in my heart. Because if he was living in my heart, there'd be no need for him to come back and take me to heaven. Jesus, the Bible says, so let's go to what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's coming a day where God is going to look at the son and he's going to say, son, go get your bride. Well, guess what? The son is not in my heart when God looks at him and says, go get the bride. You understand? Now, I know this is really edgy teaching for some of y'all, but it's the truth. Jesus is beside the father in the throne room and God is going to look at his son in the throne room, not in my heart, and he's going to say, son, go get the bride. And at that point, the Bible says, the eastern sky is going to split and there's going to be a trumpet blast and the dead in Christ are raised and then the alive in Christ are going next. And so Jesus is in heaven with the father and this is why the Bible says, draw nigh, look up. Because I'm looking to where he is, expecting, longing, and waiting, and praying for his return. You understand that? And so I'm looking up to heaven, as the scripture tells me to, because that's where he's coming from next. Now listen, I know that's going to go a whole lot against a lot of your theologies that you were raised up with, but I don't care. That's the truth. That's the truth. That is the truth, church. What's in my heart, what, or, or what's in my life, what's in my body, what's in my vessel? It's the Holy Spirit that has been deposited in me upon salvation. Paul said this, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Hey, hear that? Paul writes that, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So what's in you and I as saved believers in Christ? It's the Holy Spirit of God. Who's coming back? Jesus Christ is coming back. Now there's the truth. There's the truth. Amen. Now, if you still have question about that because your Sunday school teacher taught you for 30 years that Jesus was in your heart. Hey, if you didn't just hear from me, pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the truth. Yes. Is Jesus our Savior? Yes. yes. Is he our Lord? Yes. Is he our Messiah? Yes. Is he our Redeemer? Yes. Did he hang on the cross for us? Yes. Did he die for us? Yes. Did he defeat death for us? Yes. Does he live again? Yes. Because he lives, we live. Yes. And is he coming back to get us and take us home? Yes. The blood that was shed on the cross for us, does it forgive us of our sins? Yes. The blood washes us as the garment is dipped and comes out white, purified like snow. Yes. Is he coming back? Yes. 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 Now we're at the point in the text where Jesus is going to take the scroll from the hand of God. Let's turn there. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 5 verse 7. Remember this entire chapter of Revelation chapter 5, I said it earlier, it's all about Jesus Christ. You've got to understand that. Chapter 5 is all about the Messiah. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the Redeemer. It's all about the blood of the Lamb. And I'm so glad that he's coming back to take us home. Yes. Revelation chapter 5 verse 7. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So here's Jesus. He walks up to God the Father and he takes the scroll. Jesus goes up to God and he takes the scroll. Verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a what? Harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's you and I. We're going to get, onto that. We're going to get into that later in the book of Revelation. We don't, 
We're not going to get into that right now, but the, the, the bowls uh, being filled with the, the incense, it's the prayers of the saint. But listen to this. Let's, let's address this one thing quickly. If you didn't think heaven was already cool enough, if you didn't think there was already a lot going on around the throne, it just intensified. Amen. Jesus. Jesus walks up and removes the scroll. He gets the scroll from the hand of the Father because remember, he's our kinsman, kinsman redeemer. And because he's in the, in, the, in the line of it, he can take it. He can redeem it just as he's redeemed us by his blood. And he goes and he gets the scroll with the seven seals. And all of a sudden, the four living creatures go off. They go off. They go off. This is so not even close of a comparison. But for you dog lovers, I love dogs. Not allowed to have one in my home. But, but my wife has good reason for that. That's in another sermon. We used to have one in our home. But have you ever walked into your house and your animal is more excited to see you than your own spouse and your children? Hey, you. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I think about it now. I think about it now. Do, do, as the children, as the children grow older, do they run all through the place to come find you and just love on you and hug you and kiss you all over the place? And hopefully your spouse does, but odds are that doesn't happen anymore. Oh, you're home. Did you bring home something to eat? No matter. No matter what it is, if that dog can get up and move, <laughs> yeah. stop, stop, stop. Jesus, in so much more, I'm just trying to relate in an earthly term here for a moment, but the only one, remember, John was just weeping because no one was found to be able Amen. to get the scroll open. And then an angel makes an announcement. Jesus walks up, and the only redeemer that could redeem the entire world steps up. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, man, we just don't have a clue. We just don't have a clue of this angel, this mighty angel is proclaiming loudly, lightning, thunder, rainbow, just a sea of crystal in front, like glass out front. There's 24 elders bowing down and worshiping. There's the four living creatures, the beast, and they're doing their thing. And John is weeping because there's no one found to open this for all of mankind. And then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ, he walks up and he grabs a hold of this. And when he does, the creatures go off. Their one job is to worship the Lord. Amen. That's all they're assigned to do. Most of us, our animals, their one job is just to love us, isn't it? It's just to love us. And they go bananas over us. Amen. They go bananas over us. Yes. The Lamb of God, God steps up and at that moment shows I have redeemed my people. Yes. They're mine, and I am theirs. And the four living creatures that we learned about a couple weeks ago in prior chapter, where it said that they were created to worship the Lord, all of a sudden they continued to do their job Amen. for what they were created to do. And when Jesus grabs that scroll, when he removes it from the hand of the Father, they go off in a good way. Look at verse 7. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. That's Jesus. Each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. <clears throat> so they've gone from one song, which we read about a couple weeks ago, a few, a few weeks ago, to a new song. And this is their song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And all of heaven at this point is in rejoice mode, 
And when Jesus takes the scroll, listen to this, the weeping ended and the worship begins. If you're taking notes, write that down. If you're taking notes, write that down. When Jesus takes the scroll, the weeping ends and the worship begins. It's the same way when we receive salvation in Christ. The mourning, the weeping is over. The old man is gone. The old woman is gone. There's a new man. Born again creatures in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that church? But isn't that how God works? Isn't that how God works? Uh, He's so faithful. He's so good that even in difficult times, Christians can still worship God. To the world, we know that looks crazy because we know that God is still in control and reigning from glory, so it's easy for us to worship God at the loss of a loved one or during something tragic. It's easy for us to continue to worship because we understand that even in the loss, even in the tragedy, God is still in control of the moment. And even in all that, he's still worshiping from the throne. He's still, he's still worthy of worship, rather, from the throne. See, we, we know that everything is going to be okay even in the present moment if it doesn't seem like it is. Amen. Everyone look up here for a moment. No matter what we're going through, That's right. we're never going to stop the lightning and thunder and the rainbow around the throne. Amen. And we're never going to remove Jesus from the midst of it either. Yep. He's in control. He's in control. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. We're almost finished, or right at the end of the the chapter. Revelation 5, or verse 11, rather. No, 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 no. Let's go back to verse 9. No, no, no. Something too important to leave out here. Look at 9 again. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood, and you ransomed people for God. Now look up here for a moment. That song right there is the gospel message. Yes, it is. Amen. How important is the gospel message? It's everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The plan of God is the gospel message of Jesus yes. Christ. Remember, without Jesus, we're nothing. Amen. Through Christ Jesus, we can do all things. All things. You understand? Let's get that verse back up on the wall if we can, please. Thank you. God bless you. Look at what it says. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. That's the gospel message. For God so loved the world. It talks about him being slain. It talks about the blood of the lamb. It talks about the whole world, every tribe, language, and nation. Let's get it back up on there. We're going to read this out loud. Ready? One, two, three, go. And they... Worthy are you... For you were slain. You were ransomed. They're singing the gospel song. Amen. I mean, when you look at it like that, isn't that beautiful? How cool is that? Listen, we couldn't have made up a story that made this much sense. Amen. Amen. <laughs> isn't it amazing how it just all fits together? Yes. At the throne, they are singing the gospel message. Praise God. It's too good not to just take a moment, just pause on that. Amen. Too good. Worthy are you to take the scroll, verse 9, and to open its seals, for you were slain. So in other words, when he says, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, he's saying, you are the Redeemer. Yes. Remember earlier they said, there's no one to be found. Jesus steps up. They said, you are the Redeemer. Yes. This is the 24 elders singing. This is the four living creatures singing. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The gospel message is not just presented here on the earth, it's also sang about in glory in heaven. Wow. We're going to end this letter right here. 
verse 11. They've just sang their additional song, and verse 11 says this. Then I looked, John says. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels. Now up until this point, we've known God is in the throne room, Jesus is in the throne room, 24 elders are in the throne room, the four living beasts, the creatures are in the throne room. John is there in spirit, and we know that there was a mighty angel proclaiming loudly, but now John says, then I looked. So he's sharing something that he hadn't quite seen before. He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of what church? Many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Amen. So all of a sudden, John says, then I looked and there's myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands of angels. And those angels have a job, Amen. just like the elders have a job, the 24, yes. just like the four living creatures yes. and beasts, just like the mighty angel that was proclaiming, listen to what their job is. Saying, verse 12, those myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, verse 12, they were saying with what kind of a voice? Oh boy, you think worship was loud this morning, do you? Look up here for a moment. There's going to be no sound man in heaven for you to bother. There's going to be, going to be no sound man to find. You know who controls the volume of the voice? The individual. It's the individual. Either your heart will be full of joy. Because you've had a relationship so close in worshiping your father yes. that you're just going to be coming out of the top of your lungs. Yes. Or you never practice it here on earth and so you've got to learn to do it up there. Amen. But let me just tell you this. No matter how audible you are, you will do it. Amen. That's not a threat. That's just a promise. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Don't you think that you're going, to be able to, you're going to be able to get up into the throne room of God and think that you're just going to walk to the back of the room and sit up against the corner? No. No. If you think that way, you're just thinking in your flesh. Amen. You won't be in your flesh up there. No. You'll be in spirit. Yes. This old flesh suit that we got right now, no, no, no. This is not a glorified body. No. Okay? Now, we all wake up in the morning, we all look at ourselves in the mirror. How many people can acknowledge we don't have glorified bodies? Amen. Amen. There's coming a day when we will. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. And that, listen to this now, because this is true. That glorified body is going to cause you to do things in yes. the spirit that you never did down here on the earth Amen. because you were uncomfortable in the flesh. That's right. Some of you could be singing louder than you ever thought you could. Amen. Now, that, that's nothing to get upset about. That's good news. Amen. See, God would not be who he says he is if a third of heaven stood back and watched everybody else rejoice. Think about that. That's right. Think about that. God would not be who he says he is if a third of heaven stood off to the side and didn't want anything to do with it. Well, we believe. We just don't believe like that. No, 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 no. All of a sudden... Different styles of churches and denominations will begin to worship freely yes. because they won't have the flesh holding them back. Amen. Amen. They will have a glorified body and Praise spirit. God. And Jesus says, remember what, remember what the word says, Jesus says that the Father is looking people to worship him, how? In spirit yeah. and, truth. and truth. You see how the word just fits together like yes. a puzzle? God's not looking for you to worship in flesh. God, God's not looking for you to be carnal-minded. And, and, well, no, 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 no. He's looking for people right now. That's what the scripture says. He's looking for people right now to worship in spirit and truth. 
But even the ones that can't do it here because they still allow their flesh to hold them back from humbling themselves and worshiping. Listen, when you get your glorified body, you're going to do it anyway. Amen. You won't have a choice about it. You, you, you just won't have a choice. Listen, if, if, if you're going to believe the verse that says every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord, then you better know that every believer is going to be worshiping God around that throne. Amen. I mean, the biggest atheist in all of creation that ever was will still be forced to hit a knee yes. because of the sovereignty of God that he bows before and will have to confess that Jesus is Lord. The most hateful of men will be forced to confess who God is. Amen. Now, don't you think that they won't be able to get away with it, but the church will be able to get away with not worshiping him? No. no. See, it swings both ways, folks. That's right. Why? Because God is righteous, right. God is holy, yeah. God is a God of his word, yeah. and God is faithful. Look at what it says. Saying with a loud voice, so here are the angels, thousands of thousands, myriads of myriads, they're saying this with a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, something new just kicked in in heaven. Praise God. In one chapter alone, we've been introduced to two new songs. Yes. In one chapter alone, we've seen multiple things and positions that the 24 elders and the four beasts, the creatures, are doing. Amen. We've been introduced to a mighty angel who stands loudly proclaiming. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands, myriads and myriads of angels singing. And yet, here again, they're acknowledging that Jesus Christ was slain. Amen. Verse 13. Two verses left. Verse 13. John says this. Remember, he's caught up into this in spirit. Remember, he said that earlier in, uh, a couple weeks ago. We read that. Verse 13. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Okay, now watch this. We're just going to we're just going to do a little something, have a little fun before we leave here. Then y'all can go out and build your snowmen or whatever you want to do. <laughs> Ken, when I, when I pointed you, oh when I pointed you, I want you just, 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 I just want you to say Jesus out loud. Okay. Just, just when I point at you. You ready? Jesus. Okay. Now, when I point to all of you in a minute, I just want all of you to say Jesus. That's it. I'm going somewhere with it. Just trust me. I ain't going to throw nothing at you. When I point at the congregation, I want you just to say, Jesus. Everybody ready? Ready? Oh, I do not feel good about this. <laughs> Can't believe he's making us talk in church. The church I came from is not like this. I mean, we do not talk out loud. We do not say Jesus' name in the church. What? I had three people tell me that they were okay with it. Everybody. I wish y'all saw what I see sometimes. All right. We need to get a camera up there that shoots this way, and every once in a while, I'll just point, and we'll just flash it up there. To... Some of y'all look scared to pieces. All right. I'm just going to point. We're going to say Jesus. Ready? Here we go. Jesus. Okay. Right. Now just Ken. Jesus. Now everybody. Jesus. Yeah. Now just Ken. Now, everybody. Jesus! Look back at your verse. Every creature in heaven, verse 13, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Do you understand the volume that John just heard? Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Stop putting your expectations on what you think church is. Amen. 
and just let go and let God have all of you. Just let go and let God have your worship. He's worthy of it anyway. You're going to do it anyway in eternity. Just let go and let God have all of you anyway. We can't even imagine what that volume sounded, what that power resonated like. And all of heaven, every living creature, everywhere, just said that. I could imagine that John, this is just me imagining, having fun with it a little bit. I can imagine that John just got straight as a board. Every living creature had to profess to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the 13th verse says that every living creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them said that. That's right. Amen. Hey, listen to this. Where's God? Man, you just got la, 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 la. you just got another piece to give someone. Where's God? Oh, if you only knew, let me tell you. Because while all that's going on, yeah. every living creature has said something. That worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and might and wealth and glory and everything in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea, everything proclaims it. You ever had a moment in a sunrise or a sunset? You ever been in a field and just seen stuff blowing around? And just you know that that's the creation of God. Yeah. The Bible says, the Bible says even creation proclaims yeah. of its creator. Yes, it does. Yes. Just got to be willing to see it. Amen. You got to be willing to hear it. Yes. You got to be willing to hear it. Oh, just to be outside and hear the wind blow. Just to take the time to hear the yeah. wind blow. It's one of, my, one of my reasons that I try to get to Tennessee every year. Yeah. So I could just sit down by creeks as big as rivers yeah. with the Tennessee Creek River stones. Yeah. And I just, and my wife will tell you, I got this specific spot, a few spots that I do like to go in. And I just like to sit there and I just like to listen yeah. at the creation of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. If I died in the chair right there, I'd be all right with yes. it. I could can, I can take myself there right That's now. Right. I don't know where y'all at, but I'm in Tennessee right now by, by a creek. I'm in yeah, no, y'all don't mess with me. Y'all don't, don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. It's just, just amazing. Creation, creation proclaims of its creator. And see, when you take that verse, when you take that verse, and then you relate it to that verse, doesn't it all just make good sense? Where's God at? Oh, whoa, whoa. yes, he's in the midst of it. Verse 14, last verse of the chapter. And the four living creatures said what? Amen. You know what the word amen means? So be it. Yes. See, a lot of people say amen. They only know what, they, only know what they're saying. Well, they always say it in church. Amen. <laughs> Do you know what the word means? Yes, but we just, we just say an amen because it's, it's a churchy word. It's a churchy word. I don't know what amen means. I just say it because everybody else around me is saying it. And, oh, amen. 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 No, 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 no. Know what you're saying. The word amen means so be it. That's right. It also means this, which is basically the same thing in the Greek. Let it be so. That's right. Let it be so. So be it. Let, it. let it be so. Amen. And so what you're doing when you say amen, you're in agreement that it be the way that you said it be. Amen. So listen, look at the 14th verse. We're going to close in prayer in a moment. And the four living creatures said amen. What are they saying amen to? The, what every living creature on earth, in the sea, under the sea, under the earth, to what they just said. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And then the four living creatures whose job it is to do nothing but worship the Father and worship the Lord, they say 
Amen. Here's the really cool thing. The verse ain't over yet. Remember the 24 elders that are around the throne? When the four living creatures said amen, the elders, the 24 elders around the throne, they fall down and worship. Everybody look up here. They worshiped again. Oh, boy, if you... Praise God. All the time. Early on in ministry, it used to bother me that at 1159, you would hear people zip up their Bible covers. Zip, 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 zip. <laughs> y'all, don't, y'all don't understand what I can see and hear from up here. Zip, zip. Lord, you gave me like four pages worth of notes, Lord, and I'm only through two. (laughs) (laughs) That is one of the... How many of y'all hate the sound of your alarm clock? Because it wakes you up from that good sleep. Oh, work's here. You know what the sound is that I can't stand? (laughs) Zip, zip, zip. I, look, I say this humbly. I've been preaching for over 20 plus years. 23, 24, I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I've heard zip, zip, zip. Amen. <laughs> don't ever put God in a box. Amen. Don't ever put him up in the zipper of your Bible case. That's right. Because you can't. can't. What you did is, you just told God, I'm done learning. Uh, God, God, I don't care what you gave the pastor from this point forward. It's 12 o'clock. I've had people tell me this. You know, at 12, you should just cut it off and save some of that for next week. Early on in ministry, that bothered me. Yes, sir. Halfway through ministry, I started laughing at it. I thought it was, like, I thought it was funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the zip stopped really bothering me, and I just kind of chuckled on the inside because it says everything about the individual who's doing the zipping. Amen. Yes, Here's what I love about it. As we've been here for so many years, you all know that we ain't stopping just because 12 Amen. o'clock hit. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't hear the zips no more. And if I ever do, which is very rare, I'm like, they're a visitor. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> zip, zip, zip. <laughs> we need to make a t-shirt. My pastor goes past 12 because God says so. Amen. Preach it. Look, when the anointing's over, we'll stop. Amen. Preach it. But as long as we haven't finished talking about Hallelujah. what the word says, then we're still going to be here. That's right. Thank you, Lord. The creature said, Amen. Hallelujah. The 24 elders bowed down and worshiped again. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Two things you need to understand from chapter 5 before you go home. Number one, it's all about Jesus Christ. Yes, it is. Our life has to be all about living all for Jesus right. Christ. Amen. Without him, we're nothing. With him, we can do all things. The only way to get saved is through Jesus Christ. Yes. Jesus says that the only way to the Father is through the Son. That's right. Number two, listen to this carefully. Worship. Worship, worship, worshiping the Father. You may run from it here on this earth, but you will be confronted with it in heaven. Not because God is unfair, no, but because he's worthy of it. How many of you have ever said to your children before, boy, respect your mother. Yes, amen. 
Moms, maybe you said that to the, to the children about, you better respect your daddy. Yeah. And see, we can do that because that's the way we parent and we're thinking still in the flesh. But don't you think for a moment that a heavenly father who's the creator of all, who's righteous, who's sovereign, who's powerful, who's holy, expects any less than respect when it comes to worshiping him. Amen. The only reason, listen to this now, we were created was to worship him and bring him honor and glory right. as his children. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Yes. Father, it's so easy when, we, when we, look at, we look at church and we look at relationships that we have with you. It's so easy to understand why the devil wants to pull the church out of worship. When we understand it like that, because God has created us to worship him. Yes. So of course Satan does not want us doing that. That's Father, I pray that you would teach us, that you would prepare our hearts as we have received your word today. God, Father, that you would mold us, that you would shape us, that you would grow us, that you would strengthen us, that we would go from faith to faith, strength to strength, as your scripture calls us to, Father. Lord, we thank you that you take care of us. We thank you, Father, that you love us the way that you do. We thank you that Jesus Christ was slain for us. And by his blood, we're washed whiter than snow. If there's anyone here today that has not yet accepted Christ, I want to encourage you. He is the only way to save your soul from the pit of hell. And if you're ready to stop trying to do it on your own and receive Christ today, right where you are, you could say a prayer like this between you and God. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. I recognize, Lord, that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, save my soul. Give me the strength that you want me to have from your spirit. Teach me your ways. And may I walk in a born-again lifestyle. In Jesus' name and blood, amen. Father, I pray as we go home today, we'd be in your care. Father, that you would keep us safe. That we would take our time and travel safely and wisely. God, we thank you that this is the day you've made. Our job is to go forward, rejoice, and be glad in it. And I do pray in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ that every one of us would have an encounter this week of some sort where we can tell someone where God is. In Jesus' name and blood, for your glory, everybody said together, church, amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll be here this Wednesday. We'll be here this Wednesday for another church service. If you want to come, we'd love to have you. Uh, service starts at 7 on Wednesdays. We'll be done right around 8.30 on Wednesday. Uh, invite someone with you. We'd love to see you. God bless you. Have an amazing day in the Lord. Enjoy. Enjoy.